All right, everyone. Um, it looks like it's 11 o'clock and uh, about time for us to get going on this. Welcome everyone to our, our first webinar that we're hosting here with Auburn University Stormwater Research Facility. Um, we're hoping to do this webinar every month. The whole goal of this is we want to welcome people who are part of our research team or outside out in industry or whatever uh, to help speak about stormwater things uh, to where we can help bring about awareness. And each of these webinars will be recorded and posted onto our website to where everyone can see past presentations and kind of keep up to date with ongoing things with this. So this month's presenter, actually our, our first guinea pig is Parker Austin here. Um, he has volunteered to speak for us this first time. He is actually graduating this next month with his master's degree, so we're sad to see him leave soon, but excited that he's going out into industry and applying everything that he's learned here. But Parker will be talking about uh, designing and evaluating field scale infiltration swales for retaining and infiltrating roadway stormwater runoff. So for this thing, uh, please keep in mind, everyone has an opportunity to include Q&A. You will not be able to speak in this webinar for using the mic microphone feature, but please go ahead and direct yourself to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can ask your questions in there. If you guys have any suggestions on topics that you wanna hear about um, or any suggestions, if you wanna to volunteer to speak, um, or have any suggestions on what you want to hear about, please go ahead and either send us an email. You can message us in the chat or just any questions in general that you have. You can put those in the Q&A and we can respond to those directly. At the end of Parker's presentation, um, I'll go ahead and read off all the questions. That way we can get them answered. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for joining and I will, I will hand it off to Parker. Thanks, Janelle. So again, everybody, my name is Parker Austin, and I'm going to be talking about designing and evaluating field scale infiltration swales for retaining and infiltrating stormwater runoff. And I do quickly want to mention that there seems to be a little lag with the slide. So if I talk a little ahead and the slide doesn't change, just give it a second and it will. So let's get started. So a little bit about me. So um, Currently right now, uh, like Janelle just said, I'm a graduate research assistant student at Auburn University getting my MS in civil engineering and actually graduating on Saturday. So I'm extremely excited about that. And um, I'm really proud of all the work that I've done here and love the program that I'm in. And then and for that, I actually got my bachelor's degree at uh, Florida State University in Florida um, and civil environmental engineering. And then here's a picture of me fishing, uh, one of my hobbies I like to do with my family. Um, and yeah, so it's the project now. So our research team here is Dr. Perez. We have Dr. Fong and Dr. Donald. And this project was so large that we actually had to break it up into three different um, projects. So um, the three grad students who worked on these three parts was um, myself, Yu Ting and Diego. So before I, I get into the deep end of this presentation, I wanna just map out where we're gonna go. So um, we're gonna start with the problem statement. Why, why do we need infiltration swales? Our next is gonna be our research object, uh, objective. So what's our main goal? What do we wanna accomplish? We're gonna go into then what are infiltration swales? Then we're gonna break it up into what we did for the small scale testing and go on to some little, a little literature of that. Then we're going to um, take what we knew from the small scale testing and build it in the field at the at our construction site at our Auburn University facility. And then we're going to perform infiltration testing on these um, both these field scale um, infiltration swales. And we're going to look at surface storage volumes, the infiltration evaluation, um, moisture content sensors evaluation, settlement, and our conclusion. So our problem statement, why do we need infiltration swales? Why is this important? And our main problem is that impervious areas increase um, runoff volumes and peak flows. So actually um, when impermeable surfaces reach 10 to 20% of a, of a area, total area that was forested before, our runoff volumes are gonna double. And then when it, when it increases to 100% of that area, um, it's gonna almost uh, be five times more the amount of volume of water uh, runoff that would have happened from that area than if it was forested. 
So this is going to cause a lot of problems. It's going to cause um, increased frequency and intensity of flooding. It's going to cause increased erosion and stream bank um, erosion. And um, a main concern for me that I, I just connect with is that it increases contaminant loading and pollution um, in our waterways from collecting oils and gas and heavy metals from our highways and roadway impermeable surfaces and running them off into our waterways. And actually, in fact, we have um, directly from runoff, our, we have 13% of rivers that are polluted from um, runoff, 18% of lakes, and 32% of estuaries in our country, in the United States. So this is a problem that we wanted to tackle. And we're, we're thinking, how are we gonna do this? What's a good way to manage this? How can we keep our waters clean? So that's what takes us to our stormwater management programs or our SWIPs. So these programs use stormwater control measures that are managed by our, are regulated by our, M, our local MS4 um, entities. So real quickly, I wanna go into some definitions before we get into the infiltration swale um, components. So stormwater control measures are structural or non-structural practices that are specifically designed to manage stormwater runoff. And this can be broken down into post-construction um, stormwater control measures. So this, what this is, is pretty much saying that this stormwater control measure is gonna be there for the long term. It's gonna be there after the construction phase has completed, and it's gonna be a permanent solution that's gonna um, be there for um, a couple of for years, that's gonna be maintenance and so on. So then this is gonna be broken down into, um, this can also be broken down to low impact development, um, LID or green infrastructure, which are kind of two of the same thing, but the main goal of being that they implement sustainable methods to mimic natural hydrology of a site. And um, the difference between the two is low impact development uses um, specific engineered practices to manage stormwater runoff and green infrastructure is more broad so not only can it help manage stormwater runoff, but it can also bring, you know, air quality benefits. It can also um, be a benefit to the community, bring people together like a park. But an infiltration swale that we're talking about is all three of these. It's a post-construction, low-impact development, green infrastructure, stormwater control measure. It's, it's, a, it's kind of a mouthful, but <laughs> uh, that's what it is. So... Now we've got our definitions down a little bit. So now I want to talk about MS4 regulates LDOT. So a way that LDOT wants to, you know, be more current, wants to be up to date, is they want to they want to use this. You know, they want to be LID. They want to use um, green infrastructure. So according to their guidelines for operation, now now at every um, construction site, new construction site, they are required for to mimic the pre-development hydrology at all discharge locations use natural materials whenever as possible and to capture the small frequent um, rate events up to the 95th percentile. Um, so they created, so they have a bunch of um, stormwater control measures that they use. You know, we have stormwater tanks or rain gardens, but this is super impractical for highways and roadways. So they came up with an idea to use the post-construction infiltration swale. And that's how this got, um, created and evolved and implemented around the state of Alabama. So I like to say there's four main components of the infiltration swale. We're gonna have our vegetated open channel, then we're gonna have our engineered soil media matrix, which we're gonna get into in the next slide. And then we have our surrounding native soil, and then our check dams, which help promote infiltration as well. So this engineered media matrix is gonna be, um, our main component of the swale that's gonna, with aim goal is to promote infiltration of stormwater runoff, which helps mimic the prehydrology of the site. And it's gonna allow that water to infiltrate and then um, exfiltrate into the native soils um, and potentially help recharge the local groundwater table. So there's a lot of benefits that can come from um, these infiltration swales. Here is the current LDOT infiltration swale drawings um, that they provided for us and during this research. And like I said before, that they currently use the infiltration swale across the state. However, their per infiltration performance um, varies from different locations around the state. So that brings us to our research objective is that they got, they wanted to partner with Auburn University to do some research on these infiltration swales. And that brings us to our research objective, which is to provide LDOT 
with the modified infiltration soil design and to deliver insights on factors that affect infiltration performance. And we're gonna build this new modified infiltration soil design based on their standard um, design that they use currently around the state. So this project, again, like I said, was very large. So we divided it into three parts. We had our small scale testing, which our main goal with that was to test and create our new design. Um, the next is our large scale testing, which was which I was in charge of, which is going to be um, building what we found in the lab in, into a field sky uh, field size, and then control our testing. Um, I mean, conduct experiments and testing to evaluate its performance to see how well does this work in practicality in the field. And then lastly was um, we use modeling softwares to provide further insight and to help us have more evidence on our small scale testing um, results and our large scale testing results. So now we're getting into our small scale testing. Um, so this was my partner, Diego, who has already graduated. So what we did was, was we built columns in our um, Auburn lab and um, pretty much we use these columns to test different designs, different um, materials, different soils, and at different depths to see what's our best media design, what's gonna help. So these were our testing materials that we use. Um, these were based off of um, the LDOT design that they currently use. And they implemented the 57 stone, um, fill sand, wash sand, topsoil, and then we added some materials of our own like pea gravel. And um, there's more materials like geotextile, so we took this even further and we just make sure we did our due diligence and we did, you know, all the physical material properties of all of these materials and these soils. And then we conducted our permeability testing through these columns and infiltration testing where we did falling head and constant head. Um, this is just showing again that we did um, gradation on all the soils. We did our porosities and our bulk densities. Um, and we found that our number 57 stone um, had a very high porosity rate, which means the higher porosity, uh, the better our infiltration um, rate is going to be. And then we continued and we did our proctor test of materials, meaning we did compactions and we wanted to see how compaction relates to infiltration. So this is just showing you um, the water content with compaction of different soils, the field sand and our top soil. And we found that looking at literature review, that compaction is actually one of the major hindrances and infiltration rates. So what happens is when these air voids become compacted in our, our soil, the water cannot infiltrate through the soil as well. It can't find those air voids. So we knew that this was gonna be a problem that we wanted to take a mental note of um, when designing. And we actually found that um, according to different department transportation reports that um, the Delaware DOT found that out of their 25 inch infiltration SCMs that one to 15% of them failed due to compaction. Um, these are existing infiltration um, stormwater control measures. Um, so the next one was uh, Massachusetts DOT, uh, DOT found that out of 250, that 15 to 30% failed, and that the Minnesota DOT out of their 100 infiltration SCMs, 15 to 30% failed, and these were all due to compaction. So back into our small scale testing, we said, okay, so this is a problem. Let's test this in the lab. So what we did was, is we took our material of sand, which is in the media of the L dot design. And we said, let's compact this at different um, densities and let's run an infiltration test on them and see how they perform. So this graph is, this result is great because it shows you on the right hand side, those percentages, those are the compaction um, densities. So you have your least compaction that's gonna be more towards the top and then our highest compaction at the bottom. So for instance, if you're looking at the bottom, our 97% compaction, if you look at our permeability on the y-axis or infiltration rate, that's showing you a very, the slowest infiltration rate was found. While when we had um, a decreased compaction, our infiltration rates um, actually increased. So this is a major part in the performance of our infiltration swales and settlement over time and compaction. So next is our, um, we wanted to look into the geotextile. So let me, let me real quickly, I should have said this earlier, what the L dot design is. So the L dot design is gonna be about 10 inches of topsoil, and then it's gonna be another foot of field sand. And then they have a geotextile that separates that sand to the next layer, which is gonna be about um, two feet of the number 57 stone. The dimensions that you see on the screen are just a small scale. We had to scale everything down to fit into the columns, but um, this is what their design was. So 
we also wanted to look into geotextile because we found that a lot of research showed that geotextiles cause clogging problems actually and can be a, a major problem for infiltration. So that's what we did, we wanted to look at. So we found a case study that actually resembles what they used a column experiment and they used number, they used, um, I think number 57 stone, they filled it up and had a geotextile fabric that um, interface that divided between our, their rock layer, geotextile, and then their um, native soil in their column. And they actually ran tests with um, adding sediment into the, the column and found that the clogging happened at the um, geotextile fabric interface. So we took note of that and we wanted to, you know, let's remove the geotextile. So this is showing you the two col columns of the medias on the left-hand side have that geotextile. And then the columns on the right-hand side of your screen, we removed the geotextile and we replaced it with pea gravel. And it's showing you the infiltration rate that we found when running um, falling head tests on this experiment in the column that removing the geotextile increased our infiltration rate um, a lot more from what, than what it previously from the LDOT design. The next thing that we found was the topsoil that we used for the LDOT swale. So we sourced it locally and made sure that it was according to specs from their manual and that the topsoil layer was actually their limiting factor when we ran our infiltration tests. And when we ran infiltration permeability tests on the individual soils, this topsoil layer had the slowest infiltration rate and it's at the very top. So it has to get through that layer before it can get to the faster um, material, uh, faster soils. So we wanted to find a way to you know, mitigate this. And what we did was we used compost amendments and we added pine bark fines to the topsoil. And this is just showing you that on um, the table on your left, that the more pine bark fines compost that we added by weight to the uh, topsoil volume, the uh, um, infiltration rate pretty much skyrocketed. It increased, increased it um, significantly every single time we added more um, compost. And we actually found studies to support this, that um, compost actually alleviates compaction um, is very is highly effective. And out of all of these land use activities, they measured them by decreasing bulk density, which is pretty much meaning it's um, decompacting the soil. And they found that compost amendments out of all these um, activities had the highest um, effective um, difference in decompacting the soil along with reforestation. So we wanted to use the compost amendments in our topsoil. So with all the testing that we did, we have our new design. So what we found that our new design that had the optimal infiltration rate that we wanted to use is gonna be the modified, we're gonna call it the modified swale. So our topsoil was a limiting factor. What we did was we decreased that topsoil layer from 10 inches to six inches, and we amended it with our pine bark fines, 80 to 20%. Then we decreased our sand layer from 12 inches to 10 inches. We got rid of that geotextile fabric and replaced it with six inches of pea gravel. And then lastly, we increased our um, number 57 stone layer um, slightly to provide more storage. Also for underground in between the voids. And these are the small scale dimensions. I'm gonna get into our, what this translates to in the field. And this is just a conclusion where our major findings from the small scale from the um, testing the LDOT um, media was the topsoil was a limiting factor. We amended it um, and this increased the permeability by nine fold and that the geotextile reduced it infiltration rate and in peak gravel actually increased it by um, 2.2 um, to 3.1 times more. So now we're going to our large scale testing. So our pathway for this is that we're gonna take what we our designs from the small scale and we're gonna build them in the fields. So we're gonna construct both of them side by side in the field and we're gonna perform our simulated flow experiments to evaluate their performance and their infiltration rates, how fast do they draw down and drain. And then we're gonna uh, provide any other insights and factors on how infiltration rate was, performance was affected during different scenarios we're testing and then we're gonna make our final comparative assessment. So before we start building it, I wanna just show you our um, Auburn University facility that we have out there. And we have a, a large area, but um, we're gonna build our infiltration swell project in this highlighted red area on the left side of the screen. 
And the LDOT infiltration swell design that we're going to build out there is going to be 40 feet in length. It's going to have a four foot bottom width of the channel. We're going to have a five foot engineer media matrix. And then our side slips are going to be three to one. And then our media design that they use is going to be that translates to the field is a foot of sandy topsoil, two feet of fill sand. And then we have our two feet of number 57 stone. And that number 57 stone is wrapped on all sides with the geotextile that they use. And then we have a six inch perforated under drain pipe, but this is, we added the pipe for research purposes um, to measure water coming out from the pipe. So they do not include an under drain in their design. We just added it for research um, purposes. And then we have our six inch earthen check dams at the halfway point at the 20 foot mark of the total length. So before we build it, it's really important to do soil testing and, and um, geotechnical investigation of the area you want to implement these because if you have poor soils like hydrological soil groups um, C, D, um, or worse, um, it could it could cause your your infiltration um, swale or SEM to not perform as well as it should. So it's really important to make sure that the soils that you're testing are either hydrological soil groups A, B, and C is adequate, but we prefer, it's preferred A or B. So I did that. So I did double ring infiltrometer testing. I did this on the surface. We dug down, we dug a pit and we did it at the, uh, the interface between the media and where the native soil is gonna be. And we found that the infiltration rate was uh, 1.4 centimeters per hour. And we can use this to classify what kind of soils we have. So I wanted to add a safety factor of this. Um, so I pretty much divided it in half to make it even slower and said, let's call it 0 0.7 centimeters per hour, which is about 0 0.55 feet per day, which is gonna fit us right here at the hydrological soil group B. Um, and if you look at the right column, soil textures in the green box, it says that that's a loam or a silt loam. So that means that we're good. This is a great area for us to um, install this um, infiltration swale. I want to take it even a little further. I collected soil samples of that same location and did borings and grain size analysis. And I classified it with not using the filtration rate, but just the physical properties. And I also confirmed that it was a silty loam classification. So the area is great, it's adequate. We want to build it now. These are going to be some photos of showing you the construction process now of building the L dot swale in the field. So we did our, we know we kind of did some channel shaping, our site layout. Um, this is an aerial showing you where that L dot swale um, is going to be, that excavated pit. And then right above it is going to be a diversion berm that we made. So if we're doing construction and it decides to rain, we don't want that sediment to come in and clog. Um, the media or that native soil layer, because we found, like I said earlier, research that that's a major problem is sediment clogs these media, um, the media infiltration system. So um, we added a sediment um, diversion berm up top to prevent that from happening and discharges it away from our area. So now that that's talked about, we have our construction process for filling. So we have our five foot excavation. The next side is showing that we did, we placed our geotextile fabric and then we added a foot of number 57 stone and then put the pipe on top of that foot of stone. And then we filled that um, the rest of the stone back in with another foot for a total of two feet. And then we closed our um, geotextile fabric. The next was we placed our two feet of sand. And then next we did our one foot of topsoil. And then we did, um, we just did a 1% um, grade and channel shaping and spread the topsoil everywhere because we want to establish sod. And we used Tiffway Bermuda sod and this was in the winter time. So everything was very dormant and we just compacted and rolled the sod. We also installed um, a small weir box for that under drain pipe where it daylights. And this under drain allows us to view the water that's being infiltrated um, when we're going to introduce um, flow into to these infiltration swales and help us measure the volume of water as um, infiltration. Then we put a valve on our under drain also so we can simulate different scenarios where if we close the drain, that means that the water cannot leave 
I can only leave the media through um, infiltrating into the native soils. So we can say that this could be a poorly drained soil, while if we open that drain, it can drain quickly, the water can um, leave the system quickly, it could be simulated as a well-drained soil. Along this um, fill process that I just showed you, I installed, uh, I installed moisture content sensors at different depths and different locations and a cross section of the L dot swale. And we're gonna get into this further in a different section. This is just showing you how I did it. I, I dug a boring hole. So this is me installing the um, sensor at eight feet deep. So which is gonna be three, three feet deeper than the bottom of our media, uh, a moisture content sensor. So now that that's built, now we're gonna talk about our modified swale design that we're gonna build right next to it. So this is gonna be the same dimensions, four foot bottom width, um, 40 feet in length also, five feet engineered medium matrix, three to one slopes. And we're gonna have six inches of that um, amended top soil with the 20% pine bark fines. Then we're gonna have our 10 inches of fill sand, six inches of pea gravel, and 38 inches of number 57 stone. And, and once again, we have that under drain, that six inch under drain, and this design is um, also with check dams. So real quickly, this is just gonna show you the construction for the modified swell layout. And then our excavation process, we're installing our moisture content sensors, just like the L dot one. Um, this is showing you the um, under drain installation along with the rock. And as you can see, we're not, we're, there's no geotextile included in this design. So we don't have to worry about that, um, having to install the geotextile, which is a, it makes the um, installation process um, go by way faster. Then we added our six inches of pea gravel. Then we have our 10 inches of fill sand. Um, we also added a surface weir box to both channels to capture the water that runs off the surface of the channel. And then we did our topsoil layer and we just, um, we spread that out everywhere just like the other swale so we can um, put down sod um, and stop and stabilize the area. So now that they're both built, now we can get into the field scale testing. We can do our experimentation. So now I'm gonna talk about the experiment setups that we did. So this is gonna encompass testing these both the infiltration swales and we're gonna look at how much water do they hold at the surface? Because we need to know, that's a really important factor to know because if one holds more than the other, then it's gonna be harder to compare. So we wanna know our surface storage volumes. We're gonna do infiltration rates and drawdown evaluation. And we're gonna break this up into overall performance then we're gonna see how the infiltration rates and the drawdown um, uh, perform when we introduce water every once every day versus when we add it every three days when we are entering flow. Next, we're gonna see if wet soils of the media versus drier soils affected the infiltration. Then we're gonna open and close that under drain valve to see if that had any effect. And then we're gonna see, we performed these tests in different months and we're gonna see if there was any seasonal variation also um, with infiltration. Next, we're going to look at is our moisture content sensors evaluation, and we're going to see we're going to do or we're going to use our one day dry period testing evaluation to evaluate the sensors, and we're going to use these sensors to actually find out how fast water travels through our media uh, our media at different locations, which we're going to get into later. And then we're going to get into um, set settlement, and we actually monitored settling to see if they um, compacted over time. So our surface storage volume collection, what we did, it was pretty simple. We put plastic down and we used a pump to pump the water into a drum. And this drum had a known volume of five cubic feet. So we pretty much just counted how many buckets it took to drain this, um, both of the swales. So here are our results for that. So the modified swale on the left, the new design um, in zone two, we found that it held 26.7 cubic feet, while the L dot actually held a little bit more. It held 30.2 cubic feet. So the L dot swale holds about 3.5 cubic feet more surface water than the L dot modified swale, which is about a 10% difference. So it's really not, it's, it's, it's a little bit more water. It's not um, a lot, it's not a big, it's not a major difference, but um, 
this was um this was like one of our constraints but um we want to take a mental note because we're going to get back to this um discussion on a little bit so the next was our infiltration test like what did we do how did we set this up so this is ariel showing you um the modified infiltration swale area and the swale and in the l dot infiltration swale and then this is where the flow is going to be introduced it's going to come from those blue tubs it's going to input water from the upstream to the downstream into that surface weir box and that's going to um overflow into back into our pond where we're using the water originally so our infiltration testing components here's a closer view um of the system so we have our introductory flow system, which is gonna pump the water into our um, infiltration swale. Then we have zone one. And zone one is um, a boundary between the check dam and um, the upstream. So this is where the water that is held uh, upstream of the check dam. And then we have zone two, which is the water that's held after that check dam. And then we have a second check dam right before it enters that surface weir box. So for infiltra uh, infiltration testing, we used uh, pressure inducers, and this is called a solness level logger, which measures the um, water height of our swales over time. And, and this level logger was installed in zone two because this had the deepest um, impoundment and um, could hold the, the deepest amount of water. So this was a great location to install that. So we're only really measuring the infiltration of zone two for both swales. In the exact same locations. Uh, it was important when we started our test, we filled them up completely with water. And then you see on the um, left side of your screen is the overflow. We wanted to make sure the test starts once that overflow has stopped, because if we include the overflow, then that means that it's going to think that that is accounting for infiltration rates. And we want it to be solely from infiltrating to the ground, not also as conveyance runoff. How did we calculate our infiltration rate? It was very simple. We took our initial water height of the swale and we filled it up completely after the overflow stopped. And then we just took the difference between um, its final water height, which was zero when it's completely drained and divided that by the time it took to um, drain. And that was our infiltration rate. So that's just showing you how we did it. We filled it up and we just, we let it drain. And we did this, um, for every single test and we could do different scenarios. So, so now into our results. So our overall performance. So L dot infiltration swale test is the orange and the blue is our new design. So what this graph is showing you is our drawdown curves. So on the left hand side is the water impoundment that that level logger recorded. And it's showing you um, pretty much how long it took from it being full to um, the time it took from it to drain. And as you can see here on this graph that the L dot swale um, is shifted more to the right, um, representing longer um, drainage times, while the blue lines are more shifted to the left, representing quicker lines. And there's a little overlap in the middle with the fastest times for the L dot swale and the, um, the slowest times for the modified swale. So this is just showing you all the tests that we perform side by side um, and comparing the two, and it, it's evident to show that the modified swale had faster times in draining and infiltration. Breaking it up individually, looking at the L dot, just the L dot swale and um, uh, drawdown curves, um, these curves all kind of look the same. So every time we did a test, they're showing the same pattern, this, this similar shape. And um, I would classify it as like a concave downward curve with a more gradual and has milder slopes compared to the modified one. It's, it kind of um, turns linear at a certain point in the beginning. Um, and this linear line that's milder slope is representing that the infiltration rate is changing slowly. While when we look at our modified swale, they had a different pattern every time we did a test that resembled one another was that these curves are steeper and um, are, are the steeper and they're concave upward. So this is showing that the infiltration rate is changing um, as time goes on with this for the modified infiltration swale. It's changing faster than it is for the L dot infiltration swale. The L dot infiltration swale had a more 
consistent infiltration rate over time versus the modified. So I took um, a, an average of all those drawdown curves, and this is a curve that we've got. So our, our LDOT infiltration swale, um, it looks pretty linear. After, if you don't look at that, if not the very beginning, it drops down quickly, but then it turns pretty linear while the modified swale um, is a concave upward curve. So that red line that you just saw is how I calculated the infiltration rates. I took that in the initial height minus the final height and then I divided it by the time. And you could see that that line kind of fits that drawdown curve um, for the L dot swale. It kind of, in the beginning, it doesn't really fit, but towards the bottom, it, it's a pretty good best fit line. But I did that same method for the modified swale. And as you can see that that line doesn't fit the um, modified infiltration swale as much. Um, so we wanted to analyze this a little bit more. These are the average infiltration rates. This is how I calculate the average infiltration rate. So we want to break it up a little more. So actually, it's not just one infiltration rate, but we could break up this L dot line into two different lines and get the infiltration rates for that. And then for the modified swale, we can actually break that up into three. So we can do our first slope, the second slope of that line, and then the third. And looking at our L dot swale, that first slope had a very quick infiltration rate and then it slowed down to 0.73 feet per day compared to a very quick 4.4 feet per day. Um, so this could be due to um, soil saturation. It could be due to the type of media that LDOT um, uses. Um, it's just showing you that infiltration is, is fast at first and then it slows down. And the same thing for the modified swale, that first slope, we had a 19.1 infiltration rate feet per day. Then it slowed down to 6.4, and then it slowed down again to about 2.4 feet per day. So the overall performance that we found just using our average infiltration rate was that the modified whale had an average of 5.2 feet per day, while the um, L dot swale had an average of 1.6 feet per day. And it's wanted to just mention that uh, performing literature, uh, it's required the threshold like a, um, one foot per day. So these both meet that and they're, they're both um, um, so 5.5 five, five foot person water so that's a significant difference of, of water that the modified swale can drain in one day. Here's a, just a side by side in Paris. Well, we wait for Harper to try to get figured out. Worst case, you can ask him to record the, the second half of his uh, presentation and post it. But I did see some questions come in, so I'm going to take a stab at trying to answer them for Parker since I've been involved in the project as well. So first question I'm reading, it says, I'm uh, sure consideration was given to this based on far north of the state soil types, but did any of your studies go into non-sandy soil types? That's a great question. So for this particular study, we did a uh, infiltration soils around the hydrologic soil group B soil. And you really do need uh, these high infiltrating soils for any infiltration based practice. If if you have C and D type soils, you're not going to get the infiltration that, that you really need, and you're just going to impound water. And it's not going to go through uh, through the surrounding native soils. Um, so no, at, to this point, we focus on soil group Bs. Uh, are infiltration soils a common BMP for LDOT to implement? Uh, another really good question. So actually, the infiltration soils has, has become the go-to BMP uh, for LDOT to implement on the post-construction side of things. So um, the advantage of the infiltration swell is that it requires a lot less right of way than your traditional detention-based BMPs in your uh, retention detention ponds. Uh, and if LDOT is able to provide sufficient runoff reduction through the infiltration swell, the hope is they could save on, on right of way and costs associated with those larger detention-based practices. Looks like hey, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, as you're getting set up, I've got one more question I'm going to try to answer here. Okay. Was the clogging of the rock filter layer, including maintenance interval, a variable considered during the initial lab testing? Or was it really about finding the fastest infiltration rate initially? That's a good question as well. Yeah, so we did not look at uh, clogging, uh, although that's a very real variable to, to be considering. Uh, with our uh, our column testing, we focused on newly installed materials and we're and focusing primarily on trying to achieve uh, the fastest infiltration uh, and trying to really understand how the different materials worked, what materials were were limiting infiltration rate, which materials were uh, you know creating impoundments that were that were longer than desirable. But yeah, I, I agree it would be it'd be interesting to look at how clogging over time affects the infiltration rate. Good questions. I'll leave uh, at least these other questions coming in for Parker as he wraps up, but uh, Parker, I'll hand it off back to you. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen and hear me? Yep. Okay, I had to switch computers so you won't be able to see my face anymore, but the show must go on. Okay, so um, back to this, our overall performance, I would have just touched that the L dot swale had a drawdown time to drain completely was 12.25 hours on average and the modified was about five hours. And it was about a three fold difference uh, between the modified swale um, infiltrating faster than the L dot. And then this is just a visual um, representation. You can see the L dot swale on the, on the left during a couple hours into the test that the L dot swale is still holding water versus the modified swale is about and nearly done infiltrating water. So next what we did was th with the infiltration testing is we introduced flow every three days versus um, adding flow every once every day. So for the one day dry period, we did once on Monday and we let it drain. Then we did it on Tuesday, let it drain Wednesday and so on. Versus the three day, we did we filled it up on Monday and then the next time we would do it would be on Thursday and so on. So this is what this is showing. And we did this because um, we found historical data for the central Alabama and we found that the average rainfall event happens every three days. So this would be showing um, infiltration performance of the swales every three days, pretty much if rain happened. So just to get that three day dry period, the uh, L dot is the orange line and this is our drawdown curves and the blue is the modified swale. So the L dot infiltration rate was 2.26 feet per day. And then the modified was 5.88 feet per day. The modified swale was roughly 2.6 times faster and these infiltration rate averages, um, the difference is big enough to be statistically significant. And um, now if we look at our one day dry period test, we see that these infiltration rates decreased, which is what we expected because we're adding more water, decreasing that frequency. So from the L dot, the average was uh, 1.4 feet per day while the modified was 2.5 feet per day and the modified swale is roughly 1.8 times faster. And this, this, is, this difference is also big enough to be statistically significant. Um, this next graph is the exact same test that we did, but now I'm showing you the bar graph format with the drawdown times that it took to drain. So this one, um, I'd like to, it's better to visualize to see what happened. So the three day on your left, um, you could see that day zero, day three, day six, day nine, and so on for the L dot swale, it all is pretty consistent. It didn't really increase in time after each test. This is showing that that um, the performance was consistent and it could um, pretty much reset back to a fast infiltration um, between these storm events. And the same thing for the blue for the three day dry period, the modified, that th these times were way faster and they're also consistent so they can recover fast enough in between these storm events to um, infiltrate water. So the L dot swale average drawdown time was seven hours for this test and the modified swale is 2.6 hours. Uh, modified swale had a 4.4 hour advantage. And then for our one day dry period, um, these times are longer, which would make sense because again, we're adding more water, like I just said. And um, the L dot swale is also consistent again so the orange bar graphs are all about the same time and they average about 12.5 hours. And 
we were, were like, this isn't, this is a little interesting. We would expect it to increase, get uh, slower after every time we added water. And um, we found that using modeling data too, that um, the infiltration rate is just um, too slow in that topsoil layer that it doesn't allow to impound enough water in our um, number 57 stone layer for water to enter the under drain because when I run both of these tests, I see water exiting the under drain for the modified swale, but I never really see water come out the under drain for the L dot swale. So I wanted to relate this consistency to um, the water is not leaving the system like the modified swale was, meaning that it's at max, it's at a high saturation already. And the water also can't impound enough in that 57 stone layer to reach the, the under drain pipe due to also seepage. So back to this, the blue line is the, the blue bars of the modified swale. So this increased um, every time, which is what we predicted. Um, and we saw water exit that pipe, but the modified swale still um, had a uh, 7.1 hour um, average and it was about 5.4 hours faster. Main takeaway from this test was that increased rainfall frequency reduced both infiltration rates for both swales and that the modified swale uh, outperformed the L-dot swale for both of these frequencies. The next was wet versus drier soil. So I classified, this is the L-dot test, all the L-dot ones, we're not looking at the modified. And this is just classifying the test if the soils were wet or drier when we did the test. And I did this by using that one day and three day. So the very first day of the one day was a dry test, but every test after that was wet because we ran water through it. While for the three day, those were dry tests because it had enough time to dry up in between each test. So I classified that as dry. And that's what this is showing you. And you can see that um, there's, there's a breakaway where most of the red lines, which is drier soils, have faster drawdown times versus the wet. Um, next, it's gonna be the same thing for the modified. This one's not as clear. Um, it's kind of um, all intertangled. Um, so we wanted to look into that, breaking this down. Um, I'm gonna go a little faster just because we're at 10 minutes left. Um, we found that the um, drier soils had an average infiltration rate um, that was faster for both swales compared to the wet soils. Um, so we found that dry soils improved the infiltration rate of um, both of the infiltration swales. Next, we looked at the open and closed valve. So this is the L dot swell test only. So the blue is when we opened that valve for the under drain, and then the yellow is when we closed it. And this is showing that the closed valve actually had faster times than most of the open valve. So we knew that there has to be some type of problem with that, with the under drain or water getting into that pipe. And this is kind of showing the same thing that all the times are kind of intermingled, that it didn't show much of a change. So looking at these. Um, look at look at the L dot swale. Um, the open valve for both of them were slower than the closed valve, which we knew that that wasn't correct because um, the closed valve is holding water in there, making the soil more saturated. So we were like, hmm, this is interesting. We're going to keep a note of this. So the main takeaway from this was that the closed valve test outperformed the open valve, contrary to our prediction. Um, the closed valve tests were performed in warmer months, though compared to the open valve. So we said, okay, maybe the cause for the faster times for the closed valve is because of temperature and the seasonal variation um, that we did these tests. So we wanted to look into that. So I did the open and closed valve for, um, for both swales in the same month. And I found that for both of them, for the one day dry period, we did it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, that they're all pretty much the same, that there wasn't really any impact and that these are not statistically, these differences aren't big enough to be statistically different. So I'm seeing, this shows me that the under drain didn't, pipe didn't really have an effect on drawdown time, but doing it in the same month did. So we wanna look into that even further. Um, so we wanna look into that, this seasonal variation affecting infiltration performance. So I then broke it up even further. So this is the L-dot swale, the teal is, the, the test I did in cold months representing slower times and the warm months are the fast times to the left side. So this shows a very clear um, result that this had an effect. And um, this also showed it for the modified swale too, this graph. 
and we break it up into numerical data, the colder months on average had um, a slower infiltration rate for the L dot compared to the warmer months um, for both of the infiltration swales. So main takeaway from this was that our colder months were associated with slower infiltration rates, warmer months were associated with enhanced infiltration rates, and that this affected both infiltration swales. So now that we're going to our moisture content sensors, um, so these were the locations for the L-dot swale. We had one in the middle of the top soil, one in the middle of the sand layer. Then we had one um, in this horizontal in the native soil, four and a half feet deep. And then we had one just below the number 57 stone at the very, um, at the interface between the media and the native soil, it's five feet deep. And then we had one three feet deeper at the native soil. And then these were the locations for the modified one. Since we changed the depths of the media, we couldn't put them in the exact same locations. So we had one in the middle of the topsoil layer, one in the middle of the sand, and then we had locations that stayed the same between swales was the side native, the number 57 stone five feet deep and the eight feet deep one. And then here's just a side, -side, uh, side by side comparison of the two. So now we can evaluate. So if we're looking at just the topsoil sensor, this red line is showing you our one day dry period test that we fill the test uh, once on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so on. And the blue is the modified swale, the orange is the L dot. And what this is showing you is moisture content over time. So that red vertical line is when we added water. And as you can see, the modified topsoil moisture, uh, moisture content sensor peaked um, simultaneously right when the water was introduced, meaning it got to that sensor, it got wet, and it drained, it, the, the moisture content decreased. And it did that for every, every test, like a heartbeat. While for our L dot swale, it almost showed no, um, uh, showed nothing, it was almost a flat line. So we had to zoom in on the scale. So this is the exact same thing, but now I zoomed that scale in for the L dot swale and I, that flat line in the, that was orange is actually that orange line now, but it only shows about, it had a 1% difference in um, moisture content when I added water. So we knew that the moisture content sensors were not super reliable with their actual um, moisture content. So we, we kept that in track, but we, we kept that in our mind. But this is just showing you the difference and the peaks. So we can look at the time lag. Of, we knew the response that it was getting a response at that sensor at a certain time. And we could take the difference from when the test started to when that peak happened, which is when most of the water got to that sensor and then it drained. And we did that for each layer. So this is the sand. And then this is the side native soil. And we're just taking our differences of those peaks and we're gonna compare them. And this is our number 57 stone. You see that the peaks for the orange are further out away from that red line than the blue. I mean, water is getting to um, our modified sensors quicker. And then this is showing you our eight foot, um, the orange line. Um, we had like errors in our moisture content at the eight foot one, so we had to exclude this data. So this graph is showing you the, the times, the average times that we got. So the top soil sensor, the orange is the L dot and the blue is the modified. So this is just showing you at each sensor location, the water it took, the time it took the water to get to that sensor um, was longer for the L dot swale compared to the modified swale. And um, you could argue that the top soil sensor and the sand sensor are not in the same location for both. So if you just look at the side native soil in that 57 stone sensor, um, you can see that it still outperforms the L dot swale with these sensors as um, providing results. And these are ours. So um, onward, we, you could, you could, you could um, argue that, but the L dot swale held both 3.5 times more water than the modified swale. So that makes sense why it's a little bit slower. So I wanted to show more evidence that this is actually not the reason why that the actually the um, modified swale is faster um, independent of water volume. So I said, let's look at this 57 stone sensor because this is gonna show how fast water gets when it passes through the whole media. So this is the same graph. So instead of taking those peaks, which is measuring the volume of water, the, those peaks are the when the, vol the most volume of water passed that sensor. And instead, I wanted to look at when did that sensor initially get wet? Like when did water, when that first water drop from the infiltrated water reached that sensor? 
And that is independent of water. That is going to represent the speed it took to get to that sensor. And I did that. And I looked at that inflection point, those turning points for each one. And here again, um, for the 57 stone, you can see that um, for each test that it, the water got to that moisture content sensor for the modified swale um, way faster than the um, L dot swale. So for the L dot swale, it took about on average 1.8 hours for each test to get to that sensor. While for the modified swale, it took about 7.6 minutes to get to that sensor independent of the volume of water. Um, and this is just showing you that's our main takeaway from this. Last thing I want to cover is the settlement. So for both swales, we did, we set up 24 points in the swale and we measured the elevation um, of those points every uh, month or so. And this is just showing you those orange little flags are our fixed points that we measured on the elevation using uh, automatic laser level. And this is the result for the L-dot swale. So we found that there was no settlement actually when we, from when we installed it to um, as time went on that each one of these lines are intermingled and there's no clear um, evidence to show that the settlement occurred. And then this is for the modified swale, the exact same thing happened. We didn't really see any um, evidence of settlement. And we're going to the, we're towards the end of the presentation now. This is just showing you a cost comparison. Uh, L dot swale was $44 uh, per linear foot, while our modified design is $39 per linear foot. So it's about $5 cheaper to install this. Um, this is just going over all of the results I just talked about. So I'm going to skip through this real quick, just because I know time is up. Um, future research, um, we can, I want to continue seasonal variation. I want to do these, we could do these tests into the next winter, um, spring and summer months to really confirm that um, trend that we saw with colder months being slower infiltration rates versus warmer months being faster. With, uh, a lot of literature shows that water, water quality enhancements can come through the media. It would be cool to test how much cleaner is the water after it runs through that media. And lastly, to investigate methods on enhancing performance for the existing infiltration swales that are already um, installed, it would be cool to find ways to alleviate and, and uh, enhance their performance. And our old, our, our, we achieved our goal was to provide LDOT with a, a, new, a new design that had um, really fast infiltration rates, and we gave them a sustainable, practical, and cheaper um, design. And that's it. Um, I know we... We're at 12 o'clock now, so um, I want to thank you guys for um, listening to me and um, enduring that little weird um, glitch in the middle. But um, if you still want to ask questions, I'm here. So, and um, yeah, thank you. Parker, thank you for uh, presenting today and thanks for managing your, your internet issues on your end. Um, there were several questions that have come in and I've tried answering those as we go, just to kind of, um, you know, just based on time, but uh, Janelle, maybe do you want to moderate the, the remaining questions we have here? And if anybody else has questions, feel free to ask. We'll hang around for a little bit. Uh, you can ask your questions through the, the chat box. Yeah. Uh, so Parker, one of the questions is, were any of the R RECPs and or SOD considered and added to the top layers to reduce any possible loss of the wood fines included in the modified soil layer. Um, can you repeat re the beginning, the R, R what? Were any of the rolled erosion controlled products or yeah. and or sod considered and added to the top layers to reduce any possible losses of the wood fines included in the modified soil layer? Yeah, so that was a, we had that asked before about um, over time, do, do they separate and do they float? So adding that sod on top of that topsoil layer um, really does help establish um, and keep those pine bark fines down and into that topsoil layer. And the sod also, once it stabilizes and it roots, it can also help ground um, and stabilize that topsoil layer. And um, the roots and the grass help promote infiltration as well we use that also in our small, our small scale testing. We use grass on top of our um, columns. Uh, our next question is, as far as test selection, 
or as far as a test section, is there a minimum or maximum dimension in a swale area? Um, lengthwise, I would ask lengthwise if they're asking lengthwise or like the dimensions of the media. Um, lengthwise, these are in the field about, they could be about a hundred feet in length. They're, they're not designed to be very long. They're not miles long. Um, they're just, you know, 50, 100 feet in length. Um, as for the media design, that can be adjusted. Um, literature review, different DOTs and agencies use all different types of engineer media matrix depth. Um, LDOT used five feet. So that was our, um, our total depth that we had to stick in that range for and alter our media layers into that five foot media dimension. The partner, just to add a little bit to that, you know, the idea is to keep the infiltration swell the same geometry as a roadside channel. So that's why Alda uses, you know, a four foot wide bottom. And then the reason for going only five feet deep mm -hmm. is because if you start going any deeper with your trench, it's going to require a trench box and there'll be additional safety considerations. Um, and so keeping it five foot deep, that keeps you from having to, to, to need uh, a trench box to keep the cost down building it. Okay. Any uh, other ones? There's just one more. Um, why was the underdrain layer wrapped in fabric? Uh, couldn't that restrict the flow to the underdrain outlet? Yes. Um, like I said before, for the L dot, we ran when we introduced water. We never saw water come from that underdrain pipe. So, and one of our big um, um, predictions was it was that geotextile fabric. It was causing clogging, and the water couldn't get. It couldn't get to that 57 stone fast enough for the water to impound. Also, including how slow the topsoil layer was and um, that geotextile fabric, I, we and then the seepage rate of the native soils. Once it got to that 57 stone, it would just infiltrate into the native soils, and it wouldn't be able to. The infiltration rate of the media wasn't fast enough to fill that 57 stone layer to get into the pipe, and a major hindrance. Um, through small scale testing and literature review shows that that geotextile is a big um, hindrance and in infiltration and letting water get to that pipe and that stone layer. So yeah, and that's why we, re we removed it and we added our pea gravel instead. And we saw water, I saw water come out of that pipe, you know, five minutes after I introduced water into the top of the swale, it was really cool. And it was a lot of water, so for the modified. We got one additional question that just popped in. Uh, are there any planned installations of the modified swale on any upcoming projects? Um, as of right now, um, we have to discuss that with LDOT still. Um, that's up to them to decide. Um, our job was just to provide them with the design and it's up to them what they want to do with it. And um, we are um, gonna have a, we're gonna have a meeting with them and talk about um, uh, what we're going to do on from this point on. So, yeah. All right. That looks like all the questions for now. Um, if anyone has any last minute questions, go ahead and pop those in. Otherwise, I know we're a little bit over time. Um, thanks everyone for hanging in there uh, through the whole thing, especially during our little glitch. And we hope that everyone has learned quite a bit about this topic. Again, we're really excited that this was our first kickoff meeting for our Target Stream series here, and we hope that everyone will be able to join us on our future ones. We plan to do this again every month. And once again, if you guys have any suggestions on topics that you want to hear about, or if you want to speak, uh, please reach out to us. You can send a quick message in the chat box or uh, shoot us an email and we'd be happy to keep in touch with that. But otherwise, uh, stay tuned. We'll keep posting on our upcoming speakers that we'll have and what the topics will be on so that you guys can uh, stay tuned with all of that. It looks like we got a couple more pro uh, questions popping in. Um, and so we'll go ahead and get these answered. Um, did you do any testing with uh, highly turbid water and um, what those effects would be over time? We did not, um, we did not test that in the field with a large scale testing. Um, however, I would say that the infiltration swales are designed for um, 
post-construction. So they're there for the long term after construction is completed and everything is stabilized. Um, so they like the, the they don't try to say this is um sediment laden water isn't really supposed to be um, introduced into these swales. It's not really designed to infiltrate turbid water. It's more for runoff from the roadways into this, into these ditches. Um, but if if sediment, the turbid water is introduced to these swales um, over time, um, those fine particles in that tur turbid water are going to clog your media, and um, they will hinder and cause the filtration rate to decrease over time. And studies show that sedimentation is actually um, one of the, also the major common problems for our factors for failing infiltration swales along with compaction. Um, our next question, LDOT maintenance is sinking, I'm sorry, is sinking mowing equipment in these? Do you have any recommendations? So that's something that we've talked a couple of times with LDOT and we've had maintenance um, the maintenance bureau, bureau sit with us and um, they said, how are we going to, you know, mow these or, or keep these clean? And we are talking to them about some ideas because um, thinking about making the check dams maybe more gradual so they're not steep so that they can run equipment through the um, infiltration swales. And further um, research, actually, what we wanted to include is running mowing equipment over the swales that we built and seeing if compaction occurs after we are um, putting lawn mowers and stuff like that all over um, both of the swales and see how that affects. But we don't have any results or evidence to show that right now. Um, one of the questions is, is there a place where we can get the typical for the modified swale? I'm not sure what they mean by typical. Uh, John, if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. The, uh, the details, the cross sections. Oh, okay, drawings. thank you. Yeah, um, Dr. Perez, um, I don't have his email on here, but you can email one of us and um, I could put it in the chat and we can get you um, drawings for the um, modified infiltration swale, for sure. Put my email in. Um, and then can you provide the link to the LDOT original swell design? Yes. And I just put my email in the webinar chat. So shoot me an email so I can um, get in contact with you. As a reminder, we are going to post the video. We're going to post it to our YouTube page, which you can search on YouTube, Auburn Stormwater. It pops right up. And, uh, our hopes to get it up there uh, by the end of the day so we can, we'll be able to share with everybody. Any more? I think that's it. Uh, if anyone else has any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll be happy to answer those one on one. But otherwise, I think this concludes our our first Tiger Stream webinar series. Thank you, everyone, for joining and thank you, everyone, for sticking on a little longer for uh, and for those Q&A portions. Um, thanks again. We hope to see you next month. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Parker, for presenting. Yep. Great job, Parker. Great job, Joe. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.